Gentlemen and ladies, today we're going to have a discussion about flange surface damage assessment, ASME PCC1, nozzles and flanges. Today's discussion I have up here an ASME B165 flange, a Schedule 152 inch SA182. That would be a 304L stainless steel. And you can see that I have drawn in some simulated damage to the flange surface. We want to discuss tables D2, the allowable defect depth and width across the face. And then we want to discuss figures D3 and D4. I made a little sheet. When we're talking about the PCC1 and we're talking about the flange width, here in this cross section you see the raised face. The width W here in the diagram is not the entire width of the raised face. It's the gasket engagement width. So when we're talking about damage, we're measuring the width, the radial dimension across the width of the gasket sealing surface area. Notice how W does not go across the entire area. It's just the gasket sealing surface or the seating surface. When we're discussing this, this entire distance, if the gasket does not engage the entire width, then we need to use the engagement width, the seating surface. What do I mean by that? If you're using a spiral wound gasket that has a crush zone width narrower than the machined flange face surface width, then you need to use the gasket engagement width. If you're using a Garlock or a Teflon or a Buna rubber gasket that engages the entire width, then you would use that entire width of raised face as your measurement. But if you have a gasket that is only engaging a portion of that, then you need to measure the engagement seating surface area, which would be narrower. So that's something you guys need to keep in mind. If the gasket is not engaging the gasket seating surface full width, then you need to use the narrower measurement as your assessment. This is why it is important that when you do your inspection, you take the opportunity to look at the gasket that has been removed. That'll tell you a lot about operating cycle. And it gives you an opportunity to compare the new gasket, the gasket that it will be replaced by, to make certain that they are the same gasket. That, that is something we're looking at, is the gasket that is going back in service the same gasket as what was installed and are we reviewing that to make sure that what was used was what was supposed to be used. Compatibility of gaskets is an important thing. You need to understand that. Anyway, that's enough of my soapbox. So you notice that I wrote out some of these measurements. I was trying to do this and show a way to measure this in front of the camera so that you guys could see and rest assured that it may be possible but I don't have the filming skills to do so. You can see by me holding my Thorpe gauge up here that I can measure across the width of this and I have done so the same way as using my pit gauge to measure its depth. Now obviously since I simulated these I'm not going to get a depth but what you can see is that I've marked out their, their dimensions. And I've measured their widths just for my report. That way I know what its, its dimensions, both, both measurements. So the RD on this particular one that I'm pointing at would be 240.240 inches. Sorry, metric folk. I, I don't know what that translates to. I feel for you. So we would record the RD width as 0 0.240, 240 mils. 
it has a width laterally of 0 0.220. That would only be important for a report. Some places only want you to record the RD measurement. Be clear when you're writing these what measurement is what. For the assessment, the RD measurement, the radial dimension, is across the face. The side-to-side -side measurement is not part of our assessment. This one here, it has a, a length of 0 0.780, a little over three quarters of an inch. It has a radial dimension, RD, across the width of the gasket face of 0 0.250. This one down here, this one measures half an inch, 0 0.5, 500 mils across the face. All of these dimensions we'd go around, we'd note them. Excuse me. This is a good opportunity where you would lay out an ordinate measurement, a zero perhaps, the top dead center, and then have a radial clock measurement going about it. You could either use o'clocks, the three o'clock, the six o'clock, the nine o'clock and the 12 o'clock and or zero. Or you could use degrees, depending on how much damage and how accurate you're trying to record this, one or the other or both would be a good way to be most clear in your report. Remember, gentlemen, ladies, when we're writing these reports, it needs to be not just clear, it needs to be most clear. That's kind of a Mr. Eric pet phrase, most clear. That way, if you're using both degrees from zero to 90 degrees and 12 o'clock to three o'clock, there is less opportunity for someone to misunderstand what location you're talking about. But you also need to delineate, are you talking about an orientation facing north, looking south, and radiating from top to right hand side, or are we clocking anti-clockwise or counterclockwise for some of us, from the top as zero and twelve o'clock to the right hand side at ninety degrees, three o'clock. By stating the ordinate location, the north side looking south, we're just going to pretend that that's exactly what we're doing here, and we're telling people that it's 12 o'clock or zero degrees located at the top of the flange or nozzle, and we're rotating to the right hand side, that would be, that would be west in this ordinate location, there is no opportunity for someone to misunderstand what we have been most clear about saying. That's something you can do for all of your notations. So back to this flange, we would record the RDs. This 0 0.240, this 0.245. We could go ahead and if we were going to map it out, we could actually record the dimensions between the edges, betwixt the damage mechanisms. That way, if it was to be drawn out, either by hand or by CAD, that it could be drawn to a level of accuracy that is needed. If it needs to be perfectly accurate, you can always take a sheet of paper lay it directly over the flange face and literally scrub it. I mean by scrubbing it, you know in art class we used to take uh, a piece of charcoal or a piece of crayon and rub the the face of something so that we could get a rubbing kind of like we used to do for nameplates back in the day. If you need to be that accurate 
that's a good way to get a facsimile or an exact copy of the face. Most of us don't need to be that accurate in taking a photograph, especially with dimensions. And if I would have taken this a step further, and I'll do so now on the camera, if I would have located both the zero degree and the 12 o'clock, and I would have put top, I could have put west, and east labeled the bottom remember we used the three letter designation BTM this has made it most clear even in my photograph or in your case video of exactly what the ordinate are related to for this inspection I could even go so far as to label the piece of equipment and the nozzle number. This was on a, a vessel or a tower. It's going to have a nozzle designation. Use the original drawing if it's available. No one likes trying to translate between your report and the original drawing. If it's available, please, please, I implore you guys, ladies also, that you use the original designation. Same way for a tank. If there's an original construction drawing, use the original nozzle assignments. Both number and type. You know, if it says inlet, product inlet, or flush, or whatever, call it by that and its nozzle designation. N65, you know, if it's a Manway, the Manway 2 or whatever. That way, no one has to translate between your report and the original construction drawing. If there's not one, you're free to label them as you see fit or as you've been directed by the client. But if there is an original construction drawing available, please use the original designations. If it's an added nozzle, well, hopefully whoever's been involved in doing so has decided to add something that matches the original notations. If not, well, do your best. That's what we're inspectors for. So, back to this assessment. So we've taken all of our measurements and depths and we're going to go back and compare them against table D2 in the PCC1. Let's see if I can get this to focus here. So in D, in table D2, boy, it just doesn't want to focus. D2, we have two columns. We have a column for soft face gaskets and a column for hard face gaskets. And depending upon which one which gasket is going to be used in the installation is what depths of a defect, if any, are allowed and the sizes or the dimensions of those defects. You're going to have to do some math involved. You can either do it back in napkin or yellow pad, back envelope some people say, or you can plug them into something like Excel. That way you can determine whether or not the scattered or the clusters joined defects for pits, dents, or scratches are going to be acceptable or rejectable in accordance with the ASME PCC1. So keeping all that in mind, that's the kind of information you need to gather so that when you sit down to write this report you can do the calculations and determine yes or no is the flange face acceptable in accordance with the PCC1. Now understand you may have a client that has their own acceptance rejectance criteria. Be aware 
There's nothing wrong with a client having their own. It can be either more stringent or less stringent than the ASME PCC1. Use what you're directed to use, but make it clear in your report what acceptance, rejectance criteria you're using. And if you have none, consider using ASME PCC1 as your acceptance, rejectance criteria. Anyway, that's what I'd like to cover today. I appreciate you guys listening. Talk to you guys later. Goodbye.